Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Welcome to another session of Economy this week, wherein we are taking all the important economy related articles which have appeared in various business related newspapers and analyzing these articles. In this session, we will cover the articles which have appeared from 15th to 21st October 2022. Let's begin the discussion. The first and the most important article in this week was related to the concept of digital banking units, in short DBU. Now what is this idea of a digital banking unit? Let's try and understand that first, then look at the factual information given in various articles. Whenever you have visited a banking branch, either it is a public sector bank or a private sector bank, what you generally see is there are people, officials of the bank who are providing services to you. Now, if I want to define what is a digital banking unit in a much simpler way, replace all the people with machines. And when I say people, I'm talking about the officials that I'm talking about. For example, you want to withdraw cash rather than going to a cashier, you'll go to a machine and provide all the details and the machine will allow you to withdraw money. You want to deposit the cash. You want to open an account. You want to avail many other services. Because many of you simply say, when I give the example of withdrawing the cash, many of you simply argue saying that, sir, it is already there. It is called as an ATM. Where are you? The argument is, yes, ATM is there, but ATM doesn't provide all the services that a branch will provide to you. For example, opening a bank account, right? applying for loans, right? various other services. In simple terms, remember this compared to a bank branch which will provide the services which are there on the asset side as well as the liability side, the services that will be provided by an ATM is very limited. Now if you go to a bank branch, you will get the services both from the asset side as well as the liability side of the bank. So what do you mean by that? In simple terms, collection of deposits are liabilities for a bank. Issuing loans are nothing but assets for the bank. So in, a, in an ATM machine, you will not get all these services. But if you visit a DBU, digital banking unit, the bank will have to provide the services from both the asset side as well as the liability side. So in a simplest way, DBU is nothing but it's a physical space where the bank is providing the services to you without using the human resource. But be very careful about the term human resources here. Why? As of now, if you visit a DBU, it's not completely devoid or let's say there is, I cannot simply say there is no human resource available there. For a very simple reason, what if a person who doesn't know how to operate a machine enters into a DBU? Don't you think the bank should provide one person who will teach this customer how to use a machine? Definitely yes. That is a precise reason we want to replace the human resources. We want to replace those with let's say machines in these DBUs. But the bank says to provide information to people or let's say customers how to use the machine, there'll be certain people who will be appointed by the bank. That is the basic idea of a digital banking unit. Now the idea of DBU or the concept of DBU was announced by the finance minister for the budget which was announced for the current financial year. And in the budget, finance minister announced that in this year, the government would be opening 75 digital banking units in 75 districts in India to commemorate the 75th year of independence or India's 75th year of independence. Following that announcement, government of India, let's say the prime minister, very recently has inaugurated these DBUs. Now please remember this, these DBUs will be opened by public sector bank as well as private sector bank. And most of these DBUs as of now have been opened by State Bank of India, SBI. Now what are the other important factual related information related to DBUs? One, DBU will provide the services to the customers, both the asset size as well as the liability side. This will provide paperless services. No papers will be utilized. For example, you want to apply for a loan. You can do it online itself using this DBU machine. 
or the machine within the DBO. It will promote financial inclusion. It will also promote people utilizing digital transactions or promote the accessibility to digital transactions, especially in those regions where the digital connectivity is slightly poor or weaker. And it will also be helpful in developing a lot of digital infrastructure that is basically related to banking structure or banking sector. So these are certain very important points related to the idea of a DBU. Now next very important point. The banks which have certain years of experience providing these kind of digital transactions or digital services have been allowed by RBI to open DBUs. And RBI simply says, when you want to open these DBUs, you do not have to take any kind of approval if you meet conditions. If you meet these conditions, then you don't have to take any approval from me. You can simply open the DBUs. So these are the very, very important points. Please be very, very careful. Now, based on this, I've given an MCQ. Consider the following statements regarding DBU. It will provide services from the asset as well as the liability side as well of the banking sector. Statement 1 is correct. Out of the 75 DBUs, the highest will be opened by SBI. Statement 2 is also correct. So the right option for this statement or let's say this question will be option C both 1 and 2. Having said so, remember this also. I said public sector banks as well as private sector banks are allowed to open DBU. But the payment banks or regional rural banks, these are not allowed because their operations or their scope objectives are completely different. So these are the points regarding this article. Next very important article related to GST council. The article discusses the fact that for the last four plus months, there has been no meeting of the GST council. And this is affecting or this is having an impact on certain stakeholders in the economy. What is the issue here? The GST council generally meets very often and takes certain decisions related to GST because GST council is the apex body related to any decisions of GST. But for the last four months, there has been no meeting of the GST council. And as a result of that, there are certain confusions that are getting created and it is making very difficult for the businesses to conduct business in India. I'll come to that. I'll explain that. Just give me a minute. Now come to the rule here. As per section 6 of the procedure and conduct of business regulations of the GST. Remember this rule number can be asked in the prelims. As per section 6 of this particular rule, it says that at least once every quarter, the GST council is supposed to convene have a meeting and come out with certain outcomes. Whether or not outcomes will be achieved, that's a different issue. But at least once in a quarter, not just exactly once also, at least once in a quarter, they are supposed to meet or the council is supposed to meet and have deliberations. And for the current quarter, there has been no meeting convened of the GST council. Now many of you will simply say, sir, then it is wrong. Why is the government of India, let's say the finance minister who is the chairperson of the GST council, why are they not convening the meeting? The problem with convening the meeting is there has to be an agenda of the discussion. Something has to come up as an agenda and that will be discussed in the meeting. And the problem related to agenda of the meeting is they are supposed to take up the agenda of imposing GST on online games. And a council, or that is the committee which has been set up under the GST itself, which is headed by Mr. Conrad Sangma, it is there to submit their report to the GST council. And without having the report, how can the GST council deliberate? How can the GST council decide whether should we impose 18% GST on the online gaming, the online gaming that we have today? Or we should increase it to 28% which was in fact recommended by this committee some time ago. But basically they reverted back saying that we will give you a final recommendation in a final report. So without the committee report, how can the GST council have an agenda to discuss? And that is creating problem. What is the problem? In the last couple of discussions, we have had one discussion over the DGGI investigating an online gaming company by the name of Gamescraft, which is set up in Bangalore. 
and sending a huge amount of a tax notice of 21,000 crore rupees to this company. The problem there is, the authority which has investigated says that the tax rate which you should be applicable to you is 28%, but you have paid at 18%. Then you have a tax demand or we will send you a notice of 21,000 crore rupees, you pay it. But now there is no clarity. If the committee which was set up by the GST council had given the final report, then the council could have taken up the report and decided whether should we continue with 18% on the gross gaming uh, revenue or gross gaming revenue GGR as of now or should we impose 28% on the gross gaming value which was earlier recommended by the committee. So if this clarity is not given, it will create a difficulty in conducting businesses in India and the GST council without the committee report cannot have any agenda for the discussion and convening of the GST council. So this is the problem related to the delay in the GST council having a meeting. But is it the first time? Is it the first time that the GST council has not held a meeting in a quarter? Of course, no. In the same very much, uh, in the same very article itself, they have quoted one more instance earlier. That is from the October to May, there was no meeting held after the October 5th, which was the 42nd meeting of the GST Council till the 23rd May, which was basically the next, very next GST Council meeting of 43rd. Between that, for many, many months, GST Council did not hold any meeting. So this is not the first time that this has happened. It has happened earlier as well. But the problem with this is, if the GST Council cannot give clarity, and the authorities keep on interpreting it differently then the number of cases or let's say the number of tax notices will increase and that will hinder the process of ease of doing business in India. So this is the gist of the article related to GST council given here. Now based on this I've given an MCQ. Consider the following statements regarding GST council. One, as per the rules the GST council is supposed to meet at least once every quarter. Statement 1 is correct. Please be very careful. Underline the term at least once because as per the rule it is at least once not exactly once. Second, the GST council has a wise chairperson who is by default the finance minister of India. Second statement is wrong. The finance minister, whoever is the finance minister by default becomes the chairperson of the GST council, not the vice chairperson. In fact, there is a position of vice chairperson. Nobody has been appointed. But you tell me now, who is eligible, who is eligible by the way, to be appointed as a vice chairperson of the GST council? Is it anybody from the center, anybody from the state or the cabinet secretary? Who is eligible to be appointed or rather than appointed, let me get technical here, elected? to be appointed as the wise chairperson of the GST council. If you know the answer, please write it, answer it in the comment section. So based on the analysis, right option for the question is, option A, only one is correct. Let me go to the next article, again related to GST. In a nutshell, let me explain the concept here. Imagine there is an interpretation of the GST law as per one of the authorities they have interpret, interpreted the law in one way or the provision in one way and you as a company, your interpretation is something else. Now what will happen in this particular case? You will go to the court, you will drag the government of India, you will go to the court and as a result of this, the cases will keep on pending. That's the first point. Second very important point here, imagine you are the tax official your tax demand is let's say 10 crore rupees that is you have demanded a particular company to pay additional 10 crore rupees tax let me know does it make any logic for you to spend more than 10 crore rupees in pursuing this case i hope you understand this first point i discussed was what because of the changes in the interpretation of the gst law the number of cases will keep on increasing and that will be a burden on the judiciary and that is a fact right now Second problem is, in many of the cases, it has so happened that the government officials have pursued a case. They have basically dragged a company and they have incurred expenditure because of that, because they are continuously pursuing this case. 
and the amount of expenditure incurred by the government officials, tax department, is more than the tax demand or the tax notices value itself. Does it make any sense? Absolutely no. In that case, what government of India now proposes, it is just a proposal yet to be put out in a public domain. The proposal that is supposed to be prepared by the government says that we will introduce a dispute settlement mechanism, a time bound dispute settlement mechanism. What kind of taxes would be covered here? Basically, the government says under this particular time bound dispute resolution mechanism or dispute settlement mechanism, we are going to cover minor offenses including excise duty, service tax and customs duty. If there is any dispute regarding that or any minor offense has been committed which they have appealed against which is pending in the court. In such cases, we will introduce a dispute settlement mechanism, one time dispute settlement. And many of you will be thinking, sir, is that possible by the government? Is it good? Of course, yes. If you look at feasibility of it or economically does it work out or not, whenever there is a dispute, lot of money gets stuck up in the system. And second, because the government keeps on pursuing these particular disputes, they go to court, spend lot of money, the money along with the money which is getting stuck up, even the expenses of both the companies as well as the government will keep on racking upwards. So if you want to reduce the burden on the judiciary, want to square off your losses like this or reduce your expenses like this and make it easier to conduct businesses right basically uh, no do away with all of these particular disputes these kind of mechanisms have been used by the government earlier as well for example there was a scheme which was announced by the government earlier in 2019 related to right these kind of taxation disputes itself that is related to indirect taxes of central excise as well as service taxes earlier. The name of the scheme was Sabka Vishwas Scheme. Sabka Vishwas Scheme. And government of India says I want to emulate the same. I want to use the same model in order to address a couple of more indirect tax disputes such as involving excise duties, involving customs duties and service taxes which were there before the GST was introduced or many of them have now been subsumed under the GST. So these are certain very important points. But please be very careful. As per the proposal here, as per the proposal, this one-time dispute settlement scheme or time-bound one-time dispute settlement scheme is not given to everyone. It is given to only those people or only those disputes which are involving minor offenses. Now many of you will ask me, sir, what do you mean by minor offenses? It will not involve cases where the taxpayer has willingly evaded taxes. There is a case of tax evasion. Such cases will not be considered here. A person or a company is a repeat offender. Such cases will not be considered here. Against a company or against a taxpayer, the investigating agency has already initiated process. Such cases will not be considered here. So these are some of the cases or some of the disputes that will not be covered. Rest of them, the authority says these are minor offenses. We want to settle these offenses. This is a scheme which has been proposed by the government as of now. Again, not in the public domain, but is there in the newspaper. In the coming days, you will come across this scheme. Next very important article, the Competition Commission of India has slapped multi-crore penalties on make my trip and oyo right in fact these are not the only companies even go ibbo has been slapped with the the penalty by the competition commission of india what is the issue here simple first point competition commission of india is a statutory authority which has been set up by the government and whenever there is a, a issue such as let's say some of the companies coming together right making a cartel right or forming a cartel and trying to tip the market in their favor or basically trying to behave in such a way that or making certain decisions in such a way that the market will be in their favor or it will work in their favor and against somebody else in the market. That, that kind of a behavior, cartelization behavior is investigated against and penalties are imposed by this authority. 
in order to protect the interest of the customers or the consumers such as you and me in the market. Now, what is the issue here? Why make my trip? Go IBBO. OYO have been imposed with penalties. The argument is very simple. Follow this. Whenever you want to take a trip, let's say you want to fly to a particular place and you want to visit the place for three days, four days or five days. What will you do or what I do? I go to the website, I go to Google and try to search for services. And initially I will get the search options which are involving make my trip, go IBBO, etc. or OYO for that matter. And generally what happens is we end up entering into these websites and if we are comfortable with, which most of the times happens, we end up booking up, let's say for the stay in a hotel using these kind of websites. Now the argument here is, there is a, a contract or an agreement which is forced by the make my trip that is MMT and OYO on the hotels. On the hoteliers, there is a contract which they are entering into. And the problem is there with that contract. Now you will ask me sir, what is the problem with the contract? First point, have a look at this. Imagine you own a hotel, you provide staying services or boarding services in your hotel. Now as a hotelier or the owner of the hotel, you would want your hotel to be listed or the rooms to be listed in multiple platforms. Of course, and you want to attract as many customers as possible. Now, if you enter into an agreement or a contract with Make My Trip and OYO, they ensure that the prices that you quote in other platforms will be less, will be higher than what you are going to quote in the Make My Trip and OYO. I hope you understand this. For example, imagine you want to right, give this particular room on rental basis to let's say customers. You want to quote let's say 2000 rupees right per night or per day if you enter into an agreement with make my trip and OYO they'll say that okay right 2000 rupees it is but if you want to sell the same product that is the same room services in other platforms the pricing that you will quote in other platforms should be higher than 2000 rupees I you understand which simply means they want you to sell using their platform at a very discounted price but that price should be lowest compared to whatever price you quote in other platforms, which is not fair, which is basically right taking away some of your businesses. What if other hotels are unable to do that? What if these hotels are unable to enter into this contract with Make My Trip and OYO? Will they not lose the business? Of course, yes. That is one problem. And second problem with this kind of arrangement is that they take a huge amount of commission from this as per CCI right the order which has been issued by CCI generally it has been found that they impose a commission in the range of 22 percent to 40 percent of the room charges that are collected from the customers that's a huge amount of commission so on one side they want you to sell it at a discounted prices using their platform and second, they want to take away a lot of commission, right? lot of charges from you, which is unfair. So looking at all of these practices, the Competition Commission of India, which started, remember this, by the way, the investigation started back in the year 2019, right? So looking at all of these practices, the Competition Commission of India has imposed heavy penalties on all the three companies, that is Go IBBO, OYO, as well as Make My Trip. And in fact, it has gone one step ahead and told these companies, please review your practices. Review your practices. You cannot have these kind of agreements. These are unfair. Review your practices and rework the agreements that you have with other hoteliers as well. So this is the gist of the article provided here regarding Competition Commission of India imposing penalties. Next, another very important article. The government of India for the first time has flagged or inducted the indigenously developed aluminium freight train rigs. What do you mean by this? Simple. You have traveled in a railways. I have traveled in the railway. And whenever we travel in the railway, generally the bogies or these railways are constructed using steel. Using iron and steel. Right, right now the rigs that are used are called as LHB rigs. And compared to these, okay, compared to this, now 
indigenously we have developed aluminium freight train rigs which means compared to the rigs today compared to the trains that we are using today these aluminium rigs will be one remember this lighter lighter in, in the sense of weight right these particular rigs will be lighter and what is the advantage of this if these are lighter they will consume lesser fuels you can transport to more using the same amount of fuels so efficiency will increase the cost of consumption of fuel will come down emissions will come down this will help railways in meeting the targets of reduction in the emissions for example government of india has come out with a railway plan 2030 under that railways wants to become net zero emitter so definitely this will be helpful in achieving these kind of targets now apart from this apart from being lighter here what is the other advantages aluminium does not corrode it is a corrosion resistant it is a corrosion resistant and because it is corrosion resistant the minister says even after 30 years these are as good as new will have very good resale value in the market that is second very important advantage third very important advantage is compared to manufacturing the steel rigs manufacturing of aluminium rigs takes very less amount of our time comparatively so if you're going to take less amount of time to manufacture aluminium rigs can i simply conclude and say that the time taken for production will be lower which means the production within the market will be at a much higher pace compared to will be able to produce more and more of these rigs compared to steel rigs that we are producing today right look at all of these advantages government of india says introduction of aluminium rigs is much better and that is what government of india is going to do now in fact the rail factory which is located in rai bareli has entered into a contract or an agreement with a company from south korea in order to design these aluminium rigs or aluminium right freight rigs as such so that the production can be increased and such trains can be introduced within indian market right so these are certain very very important points regarding aluminium freight train indigenously developed aluminium freight train which has been introduced for the first time in the indian railway sector let me go to the next article the RBI oversight on one of the banks has increased and the bank that is there in the discussion or in the crosses is the Dhan Lakshmi Bank. Now apart from this uh, bank coming under the lens of RBI earlier also many cases have been filed related to the people or the stakeholders involving Dhan Lakshmi Bank. But for economics that legal battle is not important understand the concept here. What is the argument or what information that you need to derive from the article? Simple. I'm pretty sure all of you know the concept of Basel guidelines. Basel three guidelines are being implemented in the Indian banking sector. And under Basel three guidelines, you are supposed to have credit to risk weighted assets ratio, CRAR, credit to risk weighted assets ratio of 9%. That is compulsory. You are supposed to have this 9%. But very recently it has been found that Dhanlakshmi Bank, right, related to this bank, they are going to underwrite or basically write off or mark down, reduce the value of the tier 2 bonds by certain value. Don't buy hard the value, not relevant. And by reducing the value or marking down the value of tier 2 bonds, the amount of capital that is there with the bank automatically will go down. And when the capital that is available, available with the bank will go down, the credit to risk weighted assets ratio of the banking sector will come very close to this mandated 9%. It will come very, very close. Now, if you are having confusion, it, the logic is very simple here. The total amount of capital that is held by the bank divided by the total amount of risk weighted assets ratio this is the formula that is used to calculate the credit to risk weighted assets ratio. In fact, many of you will point out saying that, sir, this is not the formula you will have to write into 100, which means you will get in percentage. Simple. So, this is the formula. And if a tier 2 capital or tier 2 bonds will come down, automatically the numerator will come down. 
and when the numerator will come down what will happen to the CR AR ratio of the bank automatically that will also reduce and that is the concern citing this concern RBI has tightened its regulation over the Dhan Lakshmi Bank and it is seeking daily reports from the Dhan Lakshmi Bank as to what their promoters or the stakeholders are doing in order to improve the capital availability for the bank. That's the first point. Second very important point here. In order to improve the capital of the bank, the bank has proposed to issue rights issues. Remember this. The bank has proposed to issue right or let's say they have decide to go for a rights issue. What do you mean by rights issue? Let me give a very simple example here. Imagine here is the company ABC. Now this company ABC has owners that is a stakeholders. Let's say hypothetically W, X, Y, Z. Now whatever stake they have, right? Let's say 10%, 20%, 30% and 40%. Just hypothetical numbers. Don't fight with over these numbers. Don't fight me with over these numbers. 10, 20, 30 and 40. Total 100%. Now, whenever you talk about rights issues, rather than the company issuing these shares in the public to anybody else, they will offer these shares to the existing stakeholders. I repeat, whenever you talk about rights issues, rather than issuing these particular shares or making it public for other investors, these shares are offered to the existing investors. And generally, these are offered at a discounted price. If these shareholders do not purchase them, then basically these will be offered to other investors in the market. This is the basic idea of a rights issue. And remember this, the existing shareholders have an option. It's not a compulsion. It is not an obligation on the existing shareholders to purchase these shares. It's an option for them. If they exercise their option, they will purchase the shares. Otherwise, these shares will be issued to the other investors and the capital will be raised by the bank or company for that matter. This concept is called as a rights issue. So now this bank, Dhanlakshmi Bank, has opted for going for a rights issue. Again, there are certain legal complications not related to the issue but related to stakeholders. So these are certain points regarding RBA stepping up its oversight on the Dhanlakshmi Bank. Now, based on this, I've given a question here. Consider the following statements regarding rights issue. Under this, the shareholders are under an obligation to purchase additional shares. Under obligation? No, it's an option for them. Under this, there is a possibility that the existing shareholding may change. Of course, yes. Right? There is a possibility that the ownership, whatever is the existing ownership, that percentage might change. Second statement is correct. Right option for this question is option B, only two. Next article regarding debt recovery tribunals, DRTs, for quick resolution of certain cases. If you remember, and if you are a habitual visitor of these videos, you will remember that in couple of weeks ago or couple of months ago, we had discussed one article regarding debt recovery tribunal. And I told you that many cases which are of a high value, there is a lot of delay in resolving these cases. And as a result of this, banks are incurring huge amount of interest loss. They are worried about it. And I told that government of India was considering denominating or let's say recognizing certain benches of DRTs and asking them to oversee or take care of high resolution or let's say a high value loans like this. In fact, that has been done by the government. So in a simple sense or in simplest terms, it is just an update. We have discussed the concept earlier. This article is an update. What is an update here? Government of India has identified, remember this, has identified three courts, that is three benches in the court. That is court number one in Chennai, court number three in Delhi, that is DRT court by the way and code number one, DRT code number one in Mumbai. And all these three right, codes of DRT now will be handling high value cases. That is the cases where the value of the asset, value of the loan in contention is more than 100 crore rupees. That is the value of the debt is more than 100 crore rupees. What is the advantage? Why should we read this article? Simple. 
first you should know the concept of DIT which we have discussed earlier because remember this many of you will be confused those who are listening to this lecture for the first time ever you will be confused sir but there is already NCLT national company law tribunal where the banks can simply drag the companies there and get the recovery done resolution done why are they going to DRT then is it not wrong it is so much confusing absolutely no whenever it is a company you can drag them to NCLT but whenever it is a partnership whenever it is a partnership you will have to take them to debt recovery tribunals you will have to take them to debt recovery tribunals that is the reason the banking sector now they are saying we are at least happy that government of India is focusing on resolving high value cases first why look at the fact also in the last paragraph certain data is given the value of the cases which are basically held up at DRT as per the RBI report are more than 2 lakh crore rupees 2.25 lakh crore rupees whereas the value of cases under the dispute resolution at NCLT is much below that 1.35 lakh crore rupees which means a lot of amount of debt is stuck up at DRT we need to focus on the high value cases first so that the cases will be resolved money that is stuck up in the system will be cleared it is available for the banking sector so this is an update regarding the government of India announcing certain DRT codes which will take up only high value cases now and this can be asked in UPSC prelims please be very careful and even in the mains if UPSC will ask you a question on the nature of let's say discuss the reforms which have been implemented by the government in order to resolve the issue or the menace of NPAs please write this point there mention this point that DRTs have been appointed now these will take care of the high value lens, uh, loans or the debt of more than 100 crore rupees definitely yes this is a very good point so this is the discussion related article next article India has the potential to attract 475 billion dollars in FDI in next to five years this is as per the report which has been published by CII Confederation of Indian Industry and Ernst and Young, EY both of them have collectively published a report and this report titled Vision Developed India Opportunities and Expectations of MNCs this report states that looking at certain parameters Indian economy in the next to five years will be able to attract more than 700 I'm sorry 475 billion worth of FDI now what has happened in the last one decade what has happened in the last one decade this report quotes this data and says that if you look at from 2011 to 2021 22 there has been a rise in the amount of FDI which has been flowing in case of India if you look at let's say 21 and 22 and there's a financial year 21 and 22 in fact despite having so much of uncertainty right because of the pandemic because of the war between Russia and Ukraine because of the concern over recession which could happen in the European market etc despite of so many uncertainties or volatilities in the global market India has been successful in attracting more than 80 billion dollars worth of FDI and the report says that because India is a stable democracy the government in India has been implementing the reform successfully or successfully in the last couple of years because in case of India the demand or the consumption demand is increasing lot of digital technologies are getting implemented or introduced in the Indian economy if you look at all of this India is one of the favorable markets to attract a lot of FDI a lot of investments and that is exactly what the report says in the next five years you can expect five four hundred seventy five billion dollars worth of FDI into the Indian economy right so these are some of the very important points which have been mentioned in this report regarding FDI inflow into India now the next article in fact the last article for the day the United Kingdom Prime Minister Liz Truss has announced that she would be quitting she would be exiting as the Prime Minister now in the last 45 days there has there has been so much of a discussion that has been happening regarding UK market if I want to put everything in a nutshell follow the story here after the exit of Mr. Boris Johnson a new Prime Minister was appointed by the party of course and the new Prime Minister 
announced a mini budget and the most contentious most contentious announcement in the mini budget was the government in UK proposed that they want to reduce the taxes so that the amount of money that is there with the people out of that only less taxes will go to the government and people will have more money now using that they will consume more and more goods and services demand will be generated and that will help along with of course cut in the corporate taxes and right? along with that freezing of the energy bills etc the overall economy would be on the path of recovery that was the proposal given by the prime minister but the problem with this particular proposal and when I say it was given by the prime minister of course I hope you understand it was given by the finance minister who is part of the government here. The problem with this model that was proposed or the mini budget that was proposed was the government of UK had a huge amount of borrowing already the amount of debt of the government was very high and if the government cuts the tax rates further the amount of revenues of the government will go down which means government would be borrowing much more amount of money much higher amount of money that created panic in the market why the government's situation was already weaker with this plan the finances of the government which would, would further dip and look at this in the context of the UK economy the UK economy between let's say 2007 to 2022 has not grown by a huge margin it has remained almost stagnant and in fact because of the pandemic there is right a slowdown there is a negative growth rate which has been registered by UK and I'm pretty sure you also remember that very recently India has overtaken UK's economy in terms of the size of the GDP so looking at all of this the market went into a panic mode they lost or the investors lost the faith on the government to repay the loan started dumping the government bonds in the market and that is where the UK's central bank intervened in the market started purchasing the bonds but the the chairman of the central bank announced that they would be doing it for a very short time period just to stabilize that will not continue beyond certain time limit but after that many of the high profile people ministers within the government either were removed or they put on the papers exited from the government which made the continuation of the prime minister untenable and that is a precise reason the prime minister has announced that she would be quitting she would be putting on the papers as a prime minister now a new prime minister third prime minister in a very short span that is around 45 days would be appointed would be right uh, taking over the government of United Kingdom so this is the gist of the article which has been provided right so these are the various articles as well as the questions related to these articles which have appeared between 15th October to 21st October 2022 if you like the initiative hit the like button if you have not yet subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IAS kindly do it now thank you have a great day.